Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Kremlin File. Olga, are you all ready for this? Yes, I am. I've heard the Brits call their spies spooks. Mm -hmm. Our past episodes have been... They've been very heavy. And we thought, well, you know what? It's October. Mm Mm-hmm. My favorite time of year. It's a spooky time, right? Oh, I love Halloween. The theme, okay, of this whole... Spooky October. Spooky October. We're going to be talking with people who have operated on the ground. Spies. Today's guest is Christopher Burgess, and he has served for over 30 years with the Central Intelligence Agency. And then when he retired, the CIA gave him a Career Distinguished Intelligence Medal. He's got so many stories And one of the best follows on Twitter. So without any further ado, let's welcome Christopher Burgess. Hello, Christopher. Hi. Hi there. How are you? I'm here with my two favorite people. That's (laughs) great. That's great. And we're ready. We've got our coffee. Yes, we do. There we go. So how did you get into the agency? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I, uh, academia and I, uh, when I was a young man, uh, just didn't match. <laughs> Dropped out of college after a short period of time. It was a mutual agreement between the university, my parents, and myself. And I was driving paper around for a bank in Northern Virginia. I was making uh, about $80 a week and uh, loving it because I got to drive a car all day. And one of the banks I went to was in Roslyn, Virginia, which is where my dad's office with the Agency for International Development was. And so occasionally I take my lunch break and have lunch with him. So one day he said, Christopher, uh, you're going to have to skip lunch today because uh, I'm going to take you over and uh, introduce you to a friend of mine that I used to play cribbage with back in the 70s. And when we were in Vietnam, he lived in the same building as I did. And he walks me in and here's Bob, the recruiter at the CIA recruiting office in uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, he introduces me to Bob and he goes, uh, Bob. This is number four son. Whoa. He's different. <laughs> now, mind you, my three brothers, they all went to Georgetown uh, School of Foreign Service. <laughs> they were ultra high achievers. And then there was me. And so I sat down with Bob and I learned how little I had to oh. offer. <laughs> he was very upfront. He goes, hey, what work experience do you have? And I said, I drive a car for a uh, He goes, what education do you have? And I said, well, I dropped out of college, but I... Did really good on my SATs, and I got my report card here from high school. And he goes, yeah, so basically you are a zero. (laughs) And so here for a 19-year-old kid, it's it's deflating. He says, you just never know. So here's uh, the SF-86, 46 pages then. Now it's 100 and something. Fill it out. It's basically tell your life story. I filled it out, had my parents look at it. My dad looked at it, and he goes, Mm. no drugs? And I said, no drugs. He goes, Wow. No crime? I said, no, no crime. He goes, we thought there was crime. And I said, no, there's no crime. And so I submitted it. 11 months later, I got a phone call saying, would you like to be a file clerk at the CIA? Oh, wow. And I said, what does it pay? And they said, $95 a week. Oh. Being the mathematician I am, I took off my shoes and I quickly saw that's $15 oh, more than I had. That's it. So sign that's me up. It. And that is how I got into the CIA. I was a file clerk. I knew A to Z and zero to wow. nine. That's it. And that's it. But that I know that you grew up, right, outside of the States. You I, did not grow up. And your experiences, even as a young man or whatever, I mean, did that teach you anything at all while you were you now working at the agency? So childhood was basically in 1960. My father was a uh, VP for the Amalgamated Transit Union in uh, Washington, D.C. is where the headquarters were. Jack Kennedy got elected. My parents were uh, robust supporters of him. They were invited to various events, et cetera. And then the president asked my dad to join uh, USAID. Wow. So I grew up in Turkey and I grew up in Thailand. So I went through all of my elementary and secondary school abroad. Wow. Some would say I was a very spoiled child because it was at private schools, and I was. I got to see the world at a young age, and I ended up at the CIA, and it was a good fit. It's where I grew up. It it truly is where I grew up. I waited until uh, age 21 to get my first assignment abroad in telecommunications, but right after my 21st birthday, I was there at the door, ready to go, and off I went. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. During the 80s, you lived in Leningrad and Moscow. 
Tell us a little bit about how the Soviet Union was. My arrival in the Soviet Union was a surprise to everyone, including myself. There was a (laughs) there was an emergency vacancy in Leningrad. Basically, Mm -hmm. my predecessor's wife had a heart attack and so they had to leave and they couldn't get anyone to go there. My brother had been the administrative officer at the consulate general in Leningrad six months prior. He Mm -hmm. had left and I called him up and I think it was in Denmark at the time. And I said, hey, what's Leningrad? Can I survive it without the language? Because I had no Russian. And he says, yeah, there's good people there. And if you get the assignment, let me know. I'll give them a call and they'll put together some stuff to help you learn Russia. So I signed up. Off I went. We arrived. I think it was 10 days after the KL-007 Mm shoot down where U.S. congressman was killed. The the, uh, Russian Air Force shot down Mm -hmm. the the airliner thinking it was intruding into their airspace for nefarious purposes. And I arrived three days before Christmas. I had no Russian. I learned it on the street. I enjoyed the people very much. Soviet Union, not so much. Yeah. What were your impressions Uh, of the Soviet Union? You walked around with a bag because when you saw a line, you didn't know what the line was for. So you got into the line, you asked, what's this? Wow. And that's how I learned Russian. I, uh, my favorite phrase in Russian is "shtoeta," which is "what's that?" and that is how I learned <laughs> to speak Russian. I, I just kept going everywhere. What's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? And people would tell me, and I'd learn. But it was a tumultuous time. You ask about could you yeah. see it coming? Remember, from eighty-two to eighty-five, we we had Brezhnev die, we had Andropov die, we had Chernyenko die, and then Gorbachev mm-hmm. stepped forward, and. Now, mind you, I wasn't in Leningrad all that time. After Leningrad, because the world has a sense of humor, I got assigned to Moscow. My move, I I think I'm I'm the only person who's ever put everything in a moving truck in Leningrad and drove down to Moscow for his next assignment. But but living there in Leningrad was a blast because, again, I knew nothing. So I started reading Dostoevsky. If you read him, it takes place in St. Petersburg. You can walk Dostoevsky. As you read it, it's no, cool. it is very uh, cool. Similarly, yes. I play chess, and so at lunchtime, I grab a chessboard and I go out to a park and I sit down and I throw my chess set up, and people would absolutely sit down and, and just wipe my ass. They were so good, but I enjoyed mm-hmm. it. Mostly, I played against the surveillance. That's just the way it is. But I enjoyed the people, and so yeah, living in uh, Russia at that time was it was challenging. Let me put it that way. How was it moving around Russia as an American? I was unable to travel anywhere but to the Finnish border. You can go to uh, your embassy. You can go to the border, but otherwise, That's you just stay it. here. It. And I lived in a uh, an apartment building uh, on Vaskyevsky Ostrov mm-hmm. uh, in. Mm-hmm. Uh, St. Petersburg had Soviet citizens there, had foreigners there. It turned out it was the same building that uh, my brother lived in. Oh, wow. And I met somebody who lived in his apartment, and I said, I got an eccentric brother. He used to be a masonry guy, and he didn't trust banks, and so he was always hiding money in walls. (laughs) And they just looked at me, and they go, you do know that. All the houses are mugged. And I said, yeah, I'm a Westerner. Of course yeah. I, I think that. And they go, I'm going to go home and my house is going to be Swiss cheese. <laughs> oh my because people are going to be looking for the money. And I said, got to have yeah. a sense and of how was A lot of other people that we've talked to have just said that during that time, there was a real sense of it being a surveillance society. Did you get that sense, Chris, while you were there? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I had no friends. In the Soviet population, when they found out I was a foreigner, they immediately would step back. It didn't take long, right? They'd say hello. I'd say hello back. And they'd go, that's not a Russian (laughs) accent. (laughs) But uh, and I constantly got language tested by uh, the the officials, Mm. you know, the KGB folks, because they couldn't believe they. Anybody would send somebody to Russia with that language. <laughs> but here I was. <laughs> Here's Chris, because you're different. And, and mind you. You're different, Chris. Yeah, because I'm different. Yes. Exactly. And then, you know, when, when I left, uh, I got an entourage saying goodbye. Got, and then when I arrived in Moscow, I got a new entourage saying Oh, how nice. Yeah. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Wow. There we go. Um, in the book Spycraft, Christopher, there's a great, great chapter Okay, I think it's chapter 11. It's on the CKTAW, okay, affair. CK Talk. Yeah, CK Talk. Can you tell us about that? Because I was reading about it sure. and it is absolutely intriguing. Can you tell us about that? So uh, it's often asked, uh, do uh, CIA officers have any balls? <laughs> and uh, the, the, the answer to the question is occasionally. Uh, and CK Taw is uh, one of those examples. 
Uh, and the vignette goes kind of like this. Um, back in the 1970s, it was suspected that the Krasne Paktra Nuclear Weapons yeah. Research Institute was where the Soviet Union was developing their nuclear <laughs> weapons. Some genius, and I mean that with total respect and uh, just awe, said, well, why don't we tap the communications yeah. out of that that goes to the Ministry of Defense? CIA went to work on it. And over multiple yeah. years, they figured out how to do it. They found where the lines ran. They went into the sewer and they yeah. tapped the lines. So that ran for multiple uh -huh. years. Uh -huh. And it was compromised by a couple CIA officers. Edward Lee Howard and uh, Aldrich Ames, also a CIA officer, both compromised wow. this operation. Though they didn't have the exact details, they knew that a tap existed wow. that collected nuclear information. And so it was a matter of time before the Soviets were able to figure it out. It, it got compromised, but it was a success for so long that it, it's, it's pretty yeah. damn successful. Yeah. Interestingly, as a history fellow at the Center for the Studies of Intelligence, I wrote the classified history on this. Whoa. One. My history goes into how was it compromised, et cetera, yeah. and more detail. The, the book is a uh, fair representation okay. of uh, what, what transpired. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, Very interesting. Over the past few years, we've seen a lot of intelligence officers, State Department officials attacked with Havana syndrome. Hmm. And no one is figuring yeah. out what it is. We just read a story last week that in Austria, yep. a child was got attacked by it because they were there with their State Department officials. Also, the CIA had Burns went on a secret trip to India. One of his t task members were attacked in India. What are your thoughts on it? And have you ever seen anything like this before? My thoughts are, I'm happy that the ODNI is putting her attention to this, is uh, requesting uh, Director Burns to not only allocate resource, but uh, allocate requirements to get mm -hmm. to the bottom of it. While most fingers are pointing to Russia, it hasn't been, no one's come out and said yeah. it is Russia. But I'm going to tell you, fingers are pointing okay. that way. Why are they? Because Russia has a history of using radio flooding mm -hmm as a technique. And the technique was they were going to flood it with energy because they were already flooding the U.S. existence with gamma mm -hmm. rays. Wow. We, we saw that. And in addition, in the 70s into the 80s, and the ambassador in the 1980s protested quite uh, vocally that the U.S. population was being tagged with uh, chemicals. And these chemicals, the purpose of the chemicals were that if it was on my hands and I met with you, for example, Olga, and I shook your mm -hmm. hand, then the chemical would spread from me to wow. you. And if they suspected, you know, they would go into offices in their buildings and just go in with the black light to see if anybody had any residue that was illuminating. And if it was... Then they go do a chemical analysis and they do a DNA because my DNA and the chemical and your DNA and the chemical are different wow. than, uh, say, Monique yeah. and I. And then with that, they would say, OK, this person had some sort of contact with Burgess. How is that so? Uh, personally, uh, when we were doing samples, et cetera, my son uh, was born during my time uh, in mm -hmm. Moscow. And uh, he was six weeks old when he came back from the U.S. after the birth. And his crib, bassinet, changing table had the highest concentration of these chemicals. Oh, my God. Wow. And the, the whole purpose was to make sure they came on me. But, you know, here you got an yeah. infant with all these chemicals oh around. God. And, yeah, folks yeah. have uh, said, you know, they're not carcinogenic. They're not this. You know, I, I can put Windex, which is not a carcinogenic. But if I put enough of it in the presence of my sure. infant child, it's going to have a negative and deleterious sure. effect, perhaps mm -hmm. long term. And so I, I kind of became unhinged uh, because my, my child's yeah, right, at risk, yeah. right? And yeah. so to this day, um, Russia is probably the one country I don't go to because it's kind of a, this mutual uh, feeling that I don't like them very much, the government, because of what they did to my child. Do anything you want yeah. to me, right? I'm working. Yeah. But to do this to a child. Right. 
And so they have yeah. a history. Yeah. So I'm glad the ODNI is on it. I'm glad that the uh, but man, they've got to move faster. And in addition, Congress and the Oversight Committee has got to start pushing on this because we've seen it yeah. in China. We've seen it in Havana. We've seen it in Moscow. We've seen it uh, in Hanoi. You know, it's just yeah. too coincidental. And, you know, it's certainly not 5G. Right. So let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P. Mo, is there something interfering with your happiness? Sometimes when I do have problems that I need to discuss with someone, I don't know who to turn to because with friends and family, you know, they're not going to be, you know, 100% honest. Instead, with BetterHelp, they assess the problems and the needs that you have and they match you with their own licensed you know, professional therapists. It's not a crisis line. It's not no. self-help. It's no. professional therapy done securely online. You know, you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or even phone sessions if you want to. For Kremlin File listeners, there's a special offer and you get 10% off on your first month. You go to betterhelp.com slash Kremlin file. BetterHelp really wants you to start living a happier life. And that's today. This episode is sponsored by Policy Genius. If someone relies on your financial support, whether it's a child, aging parent, or even a business partner, you need life insurance. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare quotes from over a dozen top insurance all in one place. You could save up to 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. And you could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius to compare quotes. Eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week thanks to an award winning policy option that swaps the standard medical exam requirement for a simple phone call. This exclusive policy was recently rated number one by Forbes Advisor. Head to PolicyGenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. Head to PolicyGenius.com to get started right now. During the Cold War, Christopher, we saw Mm -hmm. a lot of cases of American agents, okay, selling information to Soviet (coughs) intelligence agencies. October the 3rd was the anniversary of the arrest of Richard Miller. Can you tell us about his case and why this case is significant? Richard Miller, the person, is insignificant. By all write-ups, he was a loser. He sold Amway out of his trunk to supplement his uh, FBI salary. And his significance is he is the very first FBI special agent to be indicted, tried, and convicted for espionage with the Soviet Union. And he became compromised via Paramour, a a young lady who had a history of contact with the FBI. Indeed, there's another special agent of the FBI who had 55 assessment meetings with her to determine if she was going to be suitable as a source. Now, 55. In my experience (laughs) of supervising field operatives... If you can't figure it out after two meetings, yeah, whether this person is going to be suitable or not suitable, it's time for you to find a new profession. But this other person, not Mr. Miller, other person had 55. So they drop the case. Miller goes out and uh, connects with her, and they become uh, a thing, uh, a lot of sex. Wow. And over time, from uh, night, she works them. And convinces him to bring out classified information. They get into her car. They drive from L.A. to San Francisco. They he, they park. She takes his credential, his FBI credential, and the secret document and walks into the consulate general of the Soviet Union in San Francisco, meets with the uh, KGB guy there and says, he's out here. Let's do business. And so here she uh, compromised him. She controlled him. She got him to commit uh, to it. Now, mind you, this is the United States. 
the FBI probably had that building wired six okay. ways to Sunday. It would not go unnoticed that she walked herself into the building. She would be identifiable because she was very active in the Soviet emigre community in Los Angeles. She had been into that building before. Um, what actions followed mm. her being there by the Soviets? We don't know. Right. I don't know. Others right. do. Right. Uh, but I'm assuming that's when it came to their attention. They investigated. Subsequently, they they tossed uh, Miller's house. They found incriminating information, Incredible. classified documents, and evidence that he was uh, planning on going to Europe to meet with the KGB in wow. October, early October. So October 3rd mm -hmm. today that we're recording yeah. this is the anniversary of his arrest. And it's a case of a weak person being manipulated. It's like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Red yeah. Sparrow. Sure. <laughs> but this is it, it. it's like this lady took yeah. a page right out of it. She was working her way through the FBI Los Angeles, it looked like, so finding, until she found somebody yeah. that would uh, finding, compromise yeah, himself. Finding the vulnerabilities and getting the, herself into those vulnerabilities. That's what well, all like agents There was a prior officer, yeah. uh, FBI special agent, who had 55 meetings yeah. with this lady. The fact that what preceded right. Miller tells me that somebody dropped the yeah. ball in there yeah. because Miller should have never had exactly. contact with her to yeah. begin with. And then uh, if you go back, again, reading history, you know, the FBI is saying maybe we sh should have done a little house cleaning ourselves, and Miller really wasn't s suitable right, for this. Right. Uh, anyway, it was really hard to uh, prosecute him. He went through three trials. Oh. He finally got prosecuted. The first trial was hung jury. The second trial was uh, guilty, but uh, they appealed and they threw it out because the polygraph had been admitted as evidence. And then the last one, interestingly, mm -hmm. the prosecutor was no one, no other than Adam Schiff. Representative oh. from California, he was a he was a sprite, thirty one, thirty two year old uh, assistant uh, U.S. attorney, and uh, prosecuting on this. A couple of years later, he went into yeah. politics. Yeah, Olga, do you hear me, Normal? Because I'm on a hot spot. Apparently, FSB doesn't want me to have internet. <laughs> they took it out. No, I'm kidding. We were talking about um, the year of the spy, right? Nineteen eighty five, nineteen eighty six. It was definitely a fascinating period. You had a lot of KGB operatives, you know, working on U.S. soil and who got caught. You had American operatives who were passing information to the KGB and GRU that ended up in actual executions of people wow. inside of Russia. I mean, it was definitely incredible. And I think Chris yeah. uh, can fill us in more about yeah. that fascinating year. Or well, years. 84, 85, 86 was tumultuous. You had the leadership of the Soviet Union changing, boom, 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 boom. Right. right, right. But off to the side, you had U.S. intelligence officers mm -hmm. who were volunteering themselves to Russia. And while we didn't know about Aldrich James at the time, he was one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know about Robert Hansen at the time. Mm. He was one of those. Mm -hmm. And mind you, Hansen predated 1985, but he he was active for, you know, on and off for over the span of 20 years. And then we had a gentleman, Edward Lee Howard, who was mm -hmm. a CIA officer who yep. defected to Russia. And in 1985-ish, yep. he, he had been let go by the CIA for cause. He was a thief. He was a liar. Unfortunately, he had also been made privy to uh, some operations that were going on in Russia. So he uh, sold those as his entree to uh, be resettled in the Soviet Union. We had the case of Pitts, Pitt. Edward Pitts, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. was being sorted out. And so 85, 86, we had uh, Yurchenko, who defected to the U.S. so wow. that he could marry his, parent, his, his girlfriend, uh, who oh. was the wife of uh, a guy up in Montreal. He identified folks. This is how we learned about right. Edward Lee Howard. He was Robert. We also had some technical stuff going on. It was during the age of the French had an asset called Farewell. And Farewell talked about technical penetrations of Western embassies. And so in the NSA library, there's this whole write-up about this NSA project called Project Gunman. I happen to be sitting in the middle of during this time period. And mm -hmm. the result was they found 17, 18 typewriters that had some very sophisticated monitoring uh, equipment installed in, wow. in them that would collect what was typed and then 
burst transmit it uh, to a listening post nearby. And mind you, those devices were not used in classified areas. They were used in the unclassified environment. Right. Mm -hmm. But still, it was information that they could get otherwise. You had, uh, in that time frame, you had the Clayton Lone Tree Corporal in the United States Marine Corps case, where the embassy telephone operator seduced him or... Otherwise, they they had a relationship that was not authorized. Uncle Sasha paid him a visit, <laughs> and the January or it was a New Year's Eve or Christmas party in Vienna, where he had been transferred to, they had tried to renew contact with him there, and he, frankly, he was in way over his head, and he approached the CIA station chief there, who he knew, and said, "I got something to tell you," and all hell broke loose because. Wow. There was this huge marine investigation globally, and there was a, it was a dark time. And initially, it was felt that he did a lot more than in the end he actually did. He was compromised by the telephone operator. And so you had all of this going on at once. And what was the end result? Well, the end result were a lot of sources of ours in the Soviet Union were being executed. Yep. Oh my they were God. going quiet. They were being executed. And we didn't know why. Because we didn't know about Ames, we didn't know about Hansen. Th- those were the reasons. They compromised these sources. Yep. Wow. Howard didn't know about them all. Howard knew about this thing we called CK Ta because he had been trained on how to service that device. Okay. But he hadn't been he hadn't been given where it's located. He just knew there was a device and this is how it worked, and he'd been trained to do that. He'd been trained in surveillance detection. That's how he escaped FBI surveillance. He used an escape technique that we had developed over the years called the Jack in the Box, Mm -hmm. where you drive around a corner and you exit and you hit the button and up pops a Jack in the Box. It looks like somebody's still riding there. And the surveillance is none the wiser and you go off and do your business. Well, he and his wife have been trained in this. And so he popped out. She takes a plunger has a wig on top of the plunger in a jacket and is holding it up as she drives into uh, their garage. And so the FBI put him to bed that night thinking that the two of them had driven into the garage after dinner. And unbeknownst to them that he made his way uh, to the airport, got on a plane the next day and started his travel to first Vienna, I think it was, and then into the Soviet Union. And to close out on Edward Lee Howard, he died at age 50 in the house that the Russians had given him. But yeah, Yeah. 85, 86 was the ugliest damn time in U.S. Soviet intelligence, if you will, face off for both sides. Wow. It, It was just a very, very busy time. Okay. Before we were coming on, we were talking about Carl and Hannah. Oh, yeah, kosher, exactly. Chris, right? The swingers of the intelligence world. Can you tell us about them, please? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The swingers of the intelligence world. I can't believe that. Okay. Tell us, Christopher, tell us all about it. What makes them somewhat unique is that this was one of the earliest cases of seeding. That Mm. has been confirmed. The coachers emigrated to the United States. They were already associated with the STB of then Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And they went there with the goal of penetrating the U.S. intelligence community. He, they were hired, he was hired as a contract link. You have to hire emigres if you want native speakers. You have to get either first generation yeah. or new arrivals, permanent legal residents that are willing to assist you in the government. And so he was hired. And he and his wife were part of the swing community of the Plato's East Coast. Retreat. <laughs> yes. I, I and through that, that <laughs> he, he met uh, a lot of folks. Some of those folks are in, uh, I'll let Olga get into the uh, more salacious details because <laughs> they have a New York <laughs> nexus. And I, I really, being a family guy, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> wow. Well, okay, and, uh, and the Soviet side, Kalugan said, we train our women to lie down. Down for our country. And he <laughs> said that they used to have a whole. Are you surprised, okay, at the way the regime has turned into really an authoritarian and Putin as an authoritarian figure? Are you surprised at this or not? I'm surprised at how Putin was able 
to maneuver his way from, mind you, when I was in Leningrad as a young whippersnapper, <laughs> Vladimir was also in Leningrad as a young whippersnapper. Uh, yeah. Wow. Right? And he seems to have, have have a lot more money in his bank account than I do. So he clearly <laughs> Just, buttered the club a little bit different. Yeah. And so I am surprised on how he was able to maneuver his way through the Russian politics because he wasn't political. He was an apparatchik. Yeah. And... A boring one. At the, that. Well, no, can you explain what that is? Because there sure. may be so some he, people he who don't know. He came from the apparatus. He was part of the machine. He He's wasn't a, machine. a leader of the machine. The Soviet Union collapsed under its own weight, and then it reconstituted itself through organized crime. Yep. Because mm. it was the organized crime element that... During the privatization, when they, they, they shifted in privatization, it was the organized crime folks that had the money. It wasn't sure. Western money coming in. And I, I was very surprised to see that. Now, the evolution, look at the Russia today compared to the Soviet Union of 1990. The average person has a better life today in Russia. You go into a supermarket there, you can get the Italian pasta barilla. <laughs> right? It's right there on the of shelf. Of course, for you can get anything Italian in Russia. Yes, okay, exactly. we know why. <laughs> we know why. But my, my point is, there aren't lines waiting for potatoes no. with the center okay. frozen. There, there are more than three vegetables available. When right. I was there, we had cabbage, beets, or potatoes. I am surprised that it has gone to the authoritarian regime. I'm more surprised that the people of Russia are putting up with this shit because here we have him elected again, where the opposition is either in prison or fell out a window. And so I'm going, yeah, that's fair and free elections, but that's an autocracy. And mm -hmm. I think the we're going to see some change there because there comes a time mm. when people just say enough, enough is enough. enough. There you go. Yeah. I have yeah. this conversation with my mom every single night. Exact this same conversation because my mom lived under the Soviet times under in the 70s. And and I'm like, they can't pull that. She I was telling Monique, like my mom, everyone was brainwashed with, you know, at the time, state media, national songs. So my mom managed to get a short radio and she would like rig the short radio to get goalless America and be yeah. able to get like a glimpse of the outside world. But that's and it. it was all about uh, during the, my time there. It was all about belonging. Christopher, in 2013, we saw the Boston uh, bombings with yep. the Tsarnaev brothers yep. and they were found guilty. Yep. Over 100 people were injured, three casualties. How much did Russia help with the investigation and what was their help? <laughs> sure. Russia and the United States have always had uh, the ability to conduct what uh, is known as liaison, mm -hmm. where the intelligence services, security services are able to communicate and share information when it's in the interests of both countries. Mm -hmm. That's normal all over the world. Yes. Right. So it's not unique to Russia. Folks think it's Odd that we do it in Russia? No, but you have to do it. You, you absolutely want that contact. You want that contact so that you can uh, get clarity. So when the Sarnoff brothers were uh, one killed, one captured in Boston, first step is you go to where they come from mm -hmm. and you ask, do you, do you know anything about these folks? And they were helpful. They, they provided information, etc. But the uh, FSB also showed their true colors. When Lang KR got involved, and that Lang KR, for those who are listening, that's the counterintelligence folks, who said, we can use this to uh, ferret out a, a CIA officer that might be uh, sitting in the embassy that we don't know about. So they, they had a volunteer contact the U.S. mission saying, I've got information on the Sarnoff brothers that you aren't mm. getting from your liaison. Okay. Put yourself in the, the U.S. position. When you get that as a volunteer, you have to go out and see what it is. Sure. Yes. All right? You're fine. And this individual said, I'll be at this corner on this date at this appointed time for the you know next three Thursdays or whatever it was. So we send someone out. We meaning the United States. They, they meet. Lo and behold, it's an ambush. Whoa. So they arrest the CIA officer. They rip his disguise off. They photograph him. Oh. Headlines. CIA screws up in Moscow. 
but that's bearing the lead mm -hmm. because what really happened there was the FSB took advantage of a situation to try to identify a CIA officer. So they volunteered to provide information that didn't exist. We went out mm. to meet them. The officer selected had three months left in his tour. Mm -hmm. He was disguised in disguised paraphernalia you would find during my era, 1985. <laughs> oh, a a, a cheap-ass <laughs> wig attached to a hat. He had a compass. He had a flip phone. So there was no new oh. technology sitting on this guy. He went to the meeting. He was arrested. When they unpacked everything, oh. the guy had asked for 50,000 euros for this information. What did he have? He had 50,000 euros. So while the main media was globally was just slapping the hell out of the CIA, what really happened there was through the hallways of the FSB goes, man, did you see that takedown that happened there? <laughs> and then the subtext, and did you see they showed up with that 50,000 euros? Yeah. So, they yeah. are good for their money. Yeah, It exactly. was like a walking billboard. Yeah. Here, we will pay you. Here you go. This is the price. Oh, my God. Okay. So, so if any of you guys want to No, up. it was the price that this individual had placed on his information. Yeah. said, you bring yeah. this money and I will yeah. share this information. That's, that, exactly. So exactly. we showed up. That, yeah. We had that, to show up. To do otherwise, what if it had right. been legitimate? No, you know, To do otherwise would have been irresponsible. To me, that case alone showed me that nothing, absolutely freaking nothing, has changed from the Soviet Union to Russia when it comes to Russian intelligence services. The FSB doesn't change. We are the target, the United States, and they're never yes. going to let up. They have their foot on the gas, and we just have to recognize okay. that foot is always going to be on the gas. To be an operative, right, what are some of the qualities that in your experience, from either yourself or from others that you've seen? So if I was going to be the advertisement for joining the United States intelligence community, I would say this. Number one, it's a noble profession. Number two, your country needs you. Mm -hmm. Number three, the more diverse we are, the better we are. And linguistically, ethnically, gender-wise, et cetera, the depth of real world experience in business and academia with linguistics proficiency is the cat's meow. If you've yeah. got that, you're so sure. much more attractive and you can pro you are providing something to the country. If you come in like I do, odds are you're not going to be able to. Uh, I was different. It's like I was a Mustang. I was <laughs> wild. I, I came in. I always had my sights on what I wanted to do. But I took this long and circuitous path to it. It wasn't, it what, there was yeah. no gimmies in there because every door I went through to interview, I was always told, you don't have an education, you don't have this experience. And I'd, I'd have to prove myself or I'd have to hand them my beer right. and show them. That's so that's today it. I say, we need the diversity. I still encourage folks, but I'm not sure I'd encourage them to have a career there. More like have a piece of your career there so that you know what's going on you know how the country is best served mm. by the intelligence community. And then go out and make a living that you can live on because you're not going to get rich working in uh, the intelligence world. No. Okay. Unless you're on the wrong side of the coin. Then, yeah. We then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Chris. So thanks a lot. Okay. We're, you're going to be coming back on because absolutely. we just love speaking with you yeah, and getting <laughs> all of these stories out. So we want to thank you for coming. Okay, today especially. And yes. can you please tell anyone who's watching, where can they find your work? So I keep an archive of my work at BurgessCT.com. And BurgessCT is also my Twitter handle, so there's some continuity there. And that's where I keep my archive, because I write for various publications. Yeah. But I, I write on the Russia, uh, espionage, national security issues, a lot on cyber, and I write from the position of trying to share a lesson. Mm -hmm. So all of my pieces have a why you should care about this. We love that. And I, I feel that's uh, my giving back, because if I'm not educating, then why am I sharing my, my knowledge? Thank you so much. My pleasure. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and please visit our website, KremlinFile.com, and find our links to our socials in the show notes. This is Season 1, Kremlin Fire, hosted by Olga Lautman and me, Monique Kamari. This is a Bunker Crew Media production. 
with executive producers Marley Clements, Jack Bryan, Grant DeSimone, Ben Brett, and Jordy Mycellus of Midas Media, with associate producers Ruby Frankel and Sarah Metz. Theme music by Oreste Camarna. Sound engineering by Mike Greenberg. Sound editing and mixing by Joy Ellett. Subscribe to Kremlin File wherever you listen to podcasts. Okay, now, before we stop recording, now for a separate segment, what is the craziest story yeah. you have to tell in your time? 